In this video, which has been sponsored by ExpressVPN, thanks to them, but more of that later, I'm going to be talking about the frustration that the commander might feel uh, when he's given a perfectly good order and yet finds that his men just seem to be standing around doing nothing. Why do men just do nothing? Well, one of the reasons is something that psychologists sometimes call cognitive blink. I want you to imagine that uh, there you are, you're in your garage, and uh, you've got a great big pile of paint tins that's been building up over the years, and maybe you should just get rid of some of them. Some of them are stupid, useless old colours you're never going to use, and some of them are dried up, and there's hardly any paint in that one. So you've got to go through... Oh. Was that a rat? Your world comes to a halt. Suddenly, you've completely forgotten about the task, the paint tins and all that. Uh, the ceiling you're unaware of, that entire hemisphere of the universe has, has just sunken into irrelevance because there might be a rat over there somewhere. You, you heard a little scuttle and you saw a dark shape and you think out of the corner of your eye and jump. You are focused on that and you come to a complete halt for that moment. That is the moment of cognitive blink. Now, uh, when an animal uh, in the wild encounters an animal, imagine you, you're a deer and it's mating season, you're a male, and there's another, there's a stag there and oh, you see him and you freeze. He looks at you, you look at him. Is there gonna be a confrontation? You're not sure. Um, it's quite important to really size this guy up because he might charge you, he might be aggressive, so you're going to have to defend yourself. Uh, he probably won't kill you though because uh, members of one species tend not to kill other members, but it still is really important because if he backs down you might get a chance to mate and pass on genes. So okay, this is an important moment, so these two animals will freeze and look at each other, focused, cognitive blink. Now. If uh, a deer does that when the, th the, the thing that suddenly pops into vision is a wolf, then that might not be uh, such a, a wise decision. It might be much better to just, just leg it, get, get away, because freezing in the, the presence of a, a, a dangerous predator is obviously very dangerous, and uh, you're much more likely to run away. But if you're a soldier, uh, walking along and another soldier pops up, what you're seeing is another member of your own species. So there is that... Ooh, Size him up, look at him, what does he want? Is he a stranger? Is he a friend? That, that's the thing we naturally do on encountering another person. Unfortunately, if that person has a machine gun and very hostile intent, that can be a really bad idea. That moment of cognitive blink could cost you your life. But most people experience this. When they see a threat, they do not immediately leap into decisive action. Instead, there's that moment of, oh, oh what's that? And they, they, they come to a halt, they freeze, and they focus on the threat. Um, now, uh, we learn socially as we grow up long before any of us becomes a soldier we we learn that being passive is actually a very good reaction in an awful lot of uh, potentially dangerous situations so there you are in the in the cafeteria and you're going along the the line with your tray and uh, someone blatantly just flagrantly pu pushes in front of you and you say <clears throat> excuse me there is actually a queue yes and i'm in a great hurry do you want to make something of this oh okay right <clears throat> Someone got out of the wrong side of the bed this morning. You're probably likely to, to think to yourself and you will just freeze there and do nothing. You don't back down. You don't run away. You just freeze. And then they get served and um, go over to their table. And then you can bond with the people serving behind, uh, behind the, uh, the, the counter. Because you're so much nicer than that guy. And you can say, ravioli please in an extra nice way and, and give them a smile and they'll give you a big smile back because you know you've demonstrated that you're so much nicer than that git who pushed in front. That social response of just oh freezing okay right has kept you safe over and over and over again. Now if you're watching this you're almost certainly male and uh, you're probably an adult so you'll have memories of having not been an adult, having been a boy and um, uh, boys fight don't they at school this is absolutely uh, standard um, so how many people did you very severely injure, put in hospital or kill? Um, I'm going to guess probably none. Now, there, yeah, there were plenty of occasions. Remember that time you picked up that HB pencil that, that had been sharpened uh, to a lethal point and you threatened to, to stab Simon in the eye with it? Yeah, but you didn't actually stab him, did you? Simon is not you know, blind in one eye today. And that time when you, you considered and even joked about pushing Jonathan off the wall, which would have been really dangerous, you didn't actually do it. You didn't go through with it. Uh, he didn't break both his legs. So most of us have this, this, uh, this experience of, of having stayed our hand, of having just, oh, when the bully, because it, 
even if you're you nails, I mean, you, for instance, you're absolutely nails. My goodness, what, what, what a, a terrifying person you are today. But there was a time when you were six years old, and when you're six, all the boys who are ten are enormously bigger than you. And so there was a time when the ten-year-old bullied you, and what did he do? Did you punch him on the nose? No. You just froze and didn't give him any grief, and you are still alive today, and everything's fine. So we have this... Uh, habit that we've got into of, of freezing and not doing anything and it has for most of us worked throughout our lives and this this habit um, gets ingrained so one of the reasons you, you might freeze on encountering the enemy in a war is this cognitive blink another one is the sort of just the habit that you've trained yourself into and possibly you've been trained in some ways during the war as well maybe you've been involved in this war for some while and, and you you've got to, to know the sound of a certain weapon being cocked or whatever and you're every time you've heard that click, click noise you've 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 frozen and looked around and that's become your habit, so that's what you do. And um, a danger of this is that you can you can stay frozen. Now, if you're on your own and you, you freeze, after a while you're probably going to think, well, I better move then. But if, if you're in company and everybody freezes, there are five of you and everyone freezes, are you going to be the first one to move? Well, nobody else is moving, so presumably they think we should carry on being still, so I'll Go with the committee opinion here and I'll carry on being still. Besides, if I move, uh, the enemy might spot me and that'll give all, they'll then spot all my mates and I'll be the one who gave us away. So uh, I'm going to wait for someone else to move. So five men freezing can stay frozen for really quite a long time. You can, of course, freeze by choice. And sometimes it's a rational and good thing to do is, is to freeze when, when you're in danger. Maybe the enemy hasn't seen you or won't see you. Um, and you could also freeze um, because of what is sometimes referred to as clinical paralysis. And you can even go into a catatonic state, which I've, uh, I don't really know a huge amount, but uh, I've read uh, some people going into a catatonic state and they, they go stiff as a board and they're completely unresponsive. Um, uh, or they, they just go ragdoll limp and are completely uh, unresponsive. Either way, they're completely useless as soldiers once they've gone into that state. But the trouble is, when you talk about going into a catatonic state or clinical paralysis, it sounds like a very definite medical identifiable thing. But actually, no one is there. No, no doctors are there measuring the, the, um, the body state of someone who's apparently experiencing clinical paralysis. And it's not that he's not moving so much as at that time he can't move for some reason. Why can't he move? Why is he clinically paralysed? Well, we don't know. Uh, as far as we know, uh, as far as I know, there's no science in this. It, so when you read about clinical paralysis, it sounds good. It sounds like there's science behind it, but actually uh, it's just an idea that there is this state of being that some people apparently get into sometimes where they just can't move for some reason. Um, anyway, um, I want you to imagine that you're in a shopping centre and uh, you've got a list of things to do and oh, does my wife really want me to buy that? It's huge, I'm not carrying that. And oh, there's an altercation over there. Some people are being very loud and shouting at each other. But um, anyway, what else does she want? Oh, she hasn't said what size. Blimey, it's coming to blows now. They're punching each other. Well, I suppose security will be along in a moment. Uh, but there are loads of people watching. Uh, I imagine they must know who they are because I don't know who they are. Anyway, uh, and you go back to your list. and. That is how most people behave, and there are loads of people who will just stand and gawp as two people in their shopping centre, in full view of maybe hundreds of people, start punching each other and doing other extremely dangerous and undesirable things, until one maverick looks around and thinks, well, is nobody going to intervene? And he rushes to intervene, and that is the moment that the spell is then broken. And, oh, someone's rushing to intervene. Uh, oh, yeah. And then you get six other guys who realise all at the same time, oh, I can be a hero too as well. And they perhaps have a, a race to be the first to intervene so they can say that it was their idea. Um, and uh, until someone breaks the spell, a large number of people can just stay frozen. And this happens in war, it seems. An awful lot of people will sit tight until somebody does no no we, we really have to move uh, and they start moving and everyone goes, oh yeah yeah we really do have to move and then things actually start happening so sometimes it can take just a, a single individual the maverick if you like uh, someone with a bit more gumption and initiative to break the spell um so that's one reason that your troops when you give an order might be doing nothing they're just sort of frozen they're going uh cognitive blink perhaps another thing uh, that they might be doing is fussing uh, now, fussing is uh, a bit of a vague term, as, as, as I dare say you spotted. Uh, it covers a multitude of sins. It's 
just doing all sorts of tasks that may be of some use, but they're not really of prime military use. They're not what's necessary right now. They're certainly not what should be your highest priority. Um, and um, there's, a, there's a story, for instance, of um, uh, an officer who was apparently a bit like David Niven, rather sort of dapping, d dapper and, and, and charming. And um, he was offered a medal in a, a battle that he was involved with uh, in Korea, but he turned it down because he was actually embarrassed about how he had behaved. Now, he'd done a lot of good things. He'd, uh, when the Chinese were attacking, he'd uh, put together a unit, got them uh, in, into a useful place, deployed them, and uh, they usefully defended a part of the front. Um, so you think, well, there you go, job done. But actually, for most of the battle, he wasn't commanding his men at all. And later, when he found out what had been happening elsewhere in the battle, he realised, you know, actually, if I'd redeployed my men during the battle, uh, once they'd done the job there to over there, they would have been far more useful. But instead, he got caught in a sort of cycle, a loop, if you like, of behaviour. He was going back and forwards um, to the HQ, to the, the first aid station. He was ferrying wounded about and he was getting reports from... HQ and he was bringing in, this was the main thing, he was bringing in ammunition, he was making sure that his men had what they needed, water bottles, magazines, he was loading up loads of extra magazines and, he, and by the end of the battle his men had a ridiculous superabundance of stuff neatly stacked up, every type of grenade in neat rows. Um, He'd gone to far more effort doing all that than he should have been when he actually, well, he, he was an officer. He was supposed to be commanding his men. And yet uh, his men uh, were greatly admiring of him because he had so much energy. He was running around all over the place and he was so cheery the whole time. And, and the people in HQ saw him. Oh, you're back. Oh, you've got more news for us. Oh, and he's off again doing some stuff for his men. Great. And so they offered him a medal. But he realised that what he was actually doing most of the time was fussing. He was not doing what really he should have been doing. Now, um... If people can manage something, if there's something they can do, they quite like to do it. Uh, and and, and they, they get uh, sometimes obsessed with details. So getting all the grenades together, and that's something I can do right now. Um, and so they, they get caught in, in that, that cycle of behaviour and end up carrying on fussing over details that are pretty irrelevant and doing a task over and over again. Uh, and sometimes it might be a, a personal thing. They might, uh, for instance, uh, be fussing over their own kit. I've read stories of men who are in shell holes very close to the enemy who then start going through their pack and, and repacking their pack and getting it just right. I've got to get it just right and they'll, they'll pack their pack three times and then and they're still not satisfied with it. Why are they doing that when the main thing they should be doing is attacking the enemy? Why are they going through all their photographs of their family? No, that's not the thing to be doing right then. There's a battle on. You should be doing that. But they start fussing and once they've started fussing it can be difficult to stop. Um, others get uh, fixated, as, as our man in Korea did, uh, on the unit and what, what, what can I do for the unit, but they're not actually doing the thing they should be doing. Um, there are uh, accounts of people who've been uh, digging in, for instance, because that's what you're supposed to do. Oh, digging in, I know how to do that. Good, I'm doing something useful, digging in, that's what you're supposed to do. I'm a soldier, this is what we're supposed to do. And they continue digging in whilst the enemy is closing to bayonet range. Um, because they get caught in that loop of behaviour. They're not really fighting, they're just fussing. And if you give them an order, they yeah, yeah, and they'll carry on digging because uh, that's where their, their, their mind is. They, they've got uh, caught in a behavioural rut, if you like. Um, now, uh, experiments have been done. Um, for instance, the, 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 I think it was the British Army that experimented with the repairing radios. So they had signallers who had been trained how to repair radios. Obviously, if you're, if you're a radio operator, you need to know uh, what's likely to break on your, uh, on your radio and how to repair it. Um, so they'd all been trained and these guys knew their stuff, but uh, they were led to believe that they were actually being shelled, that they were in a bunker and their position was being shelled. It was actually synthesised, but these guys were convinced that they were being shelled. And the guys who were convinced that they were being shelled took half as long again to mend their radio. So being under pressure slows you down. Perhaps that doesn't um, surprise you that much. But given an unfamiliar radio, uh, say that they would normally uh, repair it in 10 minutes, it was, it was taking them three times as long. It was taking them half an hour. And what they were doing was making the same stupid mistakes over and over again. This is an unfamiliar radio. You've got to remember that, no, that the such and such a dial is on that side, not that side. So when you go through the certain routine that you're supposed to do when fixing the doodah, uh, you've got to remember that it's the knob the other side. But they would just go through the normal pattern that they were used to and it wouldn't work. So they would do it again. They wouldn't stop and think, why didn't that work? Oh, the knob's the other side. No, they would 
just repeat and repeat. Why isn't it working? I did it. I did. I did the thing. I did the thing. You saw me do the thing. And they would do it again. And then afterwards, when the pressure was off, they, oh, yeah, I should have. Mm. But under pressure, you miss stuff and you get caught in cycles of behavior. Um, and uh, people have um, uh, memory filters as well. Um, slightly confusing term, but there is this idea where, where you just ignore everything other than like imagine the, how many times have you heard someone gets mugged. And they say, so who was he then, the, the guy who mugged you? Did you get a good look at him? Uh, no. But what do you mean? He was right in front of you. Yeah, was he wearing a mask? Uh, no, I don't think so. So was he ginger? Was he dark? I don't know. But they can tell you every detail of the knife because they were just completely focused on the knife that was in front of them and everything else is blanked out. Um, I was talking about um, getting caught in a loop. Now, sometimes, of course, this comes from muscle memory. So, for instance, if you've been trained to do a thing, it involves a repetitive action over and over again, then that goes into to muscle memory. And this is a possible explanation for the uh, oft-mentioned phenomenon of the multi-loaded muskets that were found at the battle after the Battle of Gettysburg. So the Battle of Gettysburg and the American Civil War has just happened. People are clearing up the battlefield, and there are an awful lot of uh, muskets and rifles lying about. And these get picked up, and it's found that they've got not one charge in them, but, but severals. A lot of them were double loaded, and some of them had a dozen charges and balls in them, and yet this thing hadn't been fired. How did that happen? Well, one possible explanation for that is that the dry firing drill that those men had been training with didn't involve putting the percussion cap actually onto the nipple uh, of, the, of the weapon, because then it wouldn't be dry firing, it'd be actual firing. Um, and Muscle memory got so used to that that in the pressure of battle, even though rationally if they stopped to think about it, oh yes, of course, you've got to add the percussion cap, otherwise it won't go bang, they were just skipping that stage. They were doing what they've been trained to do. I'm doing the thing, I'm doing the thing. This is what they're supposed to do. And if everyone is firing around you a great big volley and you go oh, like that, perhaps actually synthesizing yourself just with your own imagination, the recoil, uh, you might not notice that your gun didn't actually go bang even because uh, everyone else's drowned yours out. And perhaps you do think it was a little strange that the rammer didn't go down as far each time, but uh, what the hell? You were under so much pressure, you just kept going through the cycle. And that's maybe an explanation uh, for the, the, the Gettysburg multi-loaded uh, weapons. Now, the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, this guy would have had, uh, let's say, a, a rifle firing mini ball or whatever, and the guy next to him would have had the same, the guy the other side the same, the guy behind the same. A modern um, section, however, has got loads and loads of kit. So maybe uh, seven different, in one section, maybe seven different weapon systems, pistols, submachine guns, assault rifles. Some of them will have uh, grenade launchers, several different types of grenade, and that's just the weapons. And on top of that, they've got all the extra bits of kit. Uh, there'll be a guy with a computer, there'll be a few guys with radios, one guy will have two radios, um, night vision goggles. You've got so much stuff to fiddle with. You've got so many things that you could potentially fuss over. And if you've got all these things that are supposed to be working, you're supposed to be checking that they're all working, you can be doing that rather than something that's a little bit more urgent, a little bit more militarily useful. So again, it's, it's almost an invitation to fuss if you give a guy loads and loads of complicated kit uh, and it's all personal to him. Now, um, one of the uh, maxims that uh, the British Army used in the Falklands uh, was save the wounded for the reorg, you know, the, the second wave. You, in the first wave attacking, your job is to take the enemy position and end this fight as quickly as possible and capture or rout the enemy. That's your job. And if you stop to deal with wounded, then the, the enemy will have just more opportunities to shoot, will get more casualties, the attack will grind to a halt, the attack will then last longer, and more people on both sides will end up being killed. So it's much better if you just carry on leave the wounded for the next wave coming behind you, uh, or possibly um, uh, after the battle, maybe some of them can be dealt with then if they're not super urgent. Um, but it does happen that, of course, people do stop to pick up wounded. And uh, if you uh, wound one guy and three guys then carry him to the rear, well, you've taken four guys uh, out of the battle. And one of the things that uh, makes a difference between whether a unit is a good unit or not such a good unit is the proportion of men who end up dealing with wounded. The best units, very few men deal with the wounded and uh, very inexperienced, uh, unmotivated units. An awful lot of men uh, find an excuse, oh, for a good uh, a trip to the rear with someone who's wounded. And so that is, if you like, another form of fussing. And uh, there are battles today where uh, some incoming fire that 30 years ago would perhaps have been ignored might cause everyone to go to ground. 
uh, and if someone gets wounded, then he's given a huge amount of attention. But we, can, we uh, the British and the Americans and people like that uh, at the moment can sort of get away with it because they are fighting uh, enemies who don't have artillery and, and uh, on-call air cover and the like. So uh, if you behave that way, you're not making yourself hideously vulnerable and you're so far from the enemy uh, that uh, their shots are unlikely to, to uh, have a huge amount of effect. But imagine if having trained for this war, uh, another war starts with uh, a, a foe like the Russians, for instance, who do have lots of artillery and air cover and so forth. Uh, if, you've, uh, if you start fighting that war with the tactics that are appropriate to wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and places like that, then that could be catastrophic. Uh, and so um, there are a lot of uh, military theorists, well, I don't know a lot, but there are some military theorists um, uh, um, uh, military uh, psychologists who are saying yeah, we we really got got to make sure that we don't learn too much from this war and then apply inappropriate lessons from it to uh, to a future war. Anyway, sorry, I got a little bit off uh, off course there. Um, now, um, another reason that uh, modern troops might fuss a lot is that a lot of modern orders are rather fussy. Now, there was a time when orders came through bugle, and there weren't very many. There was advance, charge, uh, rally to the flag, retreat, and so forth, to the point military orders. Whereas now, everyone's got a radio, so you can just chat away and you can ask for all sorts of things. Uh, yes, could you, um, could you uh, uh, check that, um, uh, the, the case to see if all the rockets are in it? Because I've got a feeling that the, some of the other units have swiped some of our rockets. And can you make sure they've all, still, they've all got the charges in? Because uh, there are all sorts of fussy things, check with so-and-so, has he told so-and-so this, have they got the message, are they still in position? There are all sorts of fussy orders you can give people to give them an excuse to do something other than fighting. Oh, I've been given an order, I'm supposed to check this, I'm supposed to ask him to do that, um, I'm supposed to report back on whatever. Fussy orders like that cause people to fuss more. So that's another reason that uh, people might not be uh, doing all that much um, in the battlefield because they're fussing and maybe as a commander it's your fault. Um, keep the radio chatter to a minimum. Um, actually a thought just occurs to me, it's a bit random, um, about cohesion. Uh, people talk about uh, cohesion in a unit as being a good thing uh, but sometimes it can be a bad thing. Um, if loads of people, as I mentioned before, freeze, then other people will freeze. And the, the more coherent, uh, the more together a unit is, the greater that effect can be. So if you have a load of guys who are all just sitting tight doing nothing, and they're in a, 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 an enemy unit with tremendous cohesion, they will all sit tight and do nothing. If you've got an enemy that's actually not so uh, uh, coherent, uh, then he, he may find, you may find that um, some people use their initiative more. Uh, if some people start running, they might just be looked at, oh, where are they running? But if you've got a unit that's really together, really coherent, uh, then the whole unit might run. So when, things, when, an, when, uh, when the enemy is doing something disadvantageous, you actually want the enemy to, to be cohesive, because then almost all the enemy will, will do that thing. Uh, anyway, I think perhaps it's time that I, uh, I pick up my uke, and uh, say something like, it's, um, it's time for the sponsor, it's time to earn some dosh, and this general sponsor is ExpressVPN. Yes, ExpressVPN has very generously uh, sponsored this video. Now you may be wondering, what's ExpressVPN? What is a VPN? Well, VPN, Virtual Private Network. Now. Um, why might you want one of these? Well, um, you might uh, for security and for peace of mind. You see, um, your internet service provider, your uh, ISP, oh yes, I know all the lingo, um, is aware of all your web searches. You may go on, on, onto private browsing or whatever, incognito, uh, on your browser, but actually your internet service provider still knows what, where, where you've been uh, uh, surfing on the, on the web and what you've been looking at. And perhaps you don't want that. Maybe for extra privacy, you'd like to use a VPN so that even your internet service provider doesn't actually know what you've been looking at. Or maybe uh, you want to read a certain news report, but the powers that be in your nation have decided that you shouldn't be allowed to read that sort of uh, propaganda. And uh, so maybe you could pretend to be from some other country, and that you can do with a VPN. Now, ExpressVPN has thousands of servers scattered around the globe in 94 different countries, and so you can pretend to be uh, from wherever you are, 
from one of those places. Um, you might, for instance, want to watch a video, but because of a copyright dispute in your country, you can't see it there. Oh, well, I'll be somewhere else. Oh, I'm in Canada now, and oh, I can see it. Um, so that's another use. Um, but security and peace of mind might be, uh, might be top of your agenda. Um, in my case, uh, when I'm at home, I usually don't bother with VPNs, but when I'm on the move, uh, in a railway station or particularly airports, and I'm using the Wi-Fi there, I don't because think of Wi-Fi in an airport is actually pretty powerful to cover such a big area, and there could be any sort of person lurking with a laptop somewhere, ready to nick my bank details, and oh, wouldn't that be terrible? So I don't want that to happen. So a VPN is pretty handy in that sort of situation. So security and peace of mind. Now, um, there is an offer if you go to www. Uh, expressvpn dot com stroke yes stroke okay not slash I'm British so I say stroke honestly slash you barbarians stroke Lindy Beige as, as example here or you could just click the uh, link in the description then you can take advantage of an offer and the offer is three months for free yes if you take out uh, a year's um, subscription with them then you get the first three months for free so 25 percent off if you prefer to put it that way um, uh, which is the equivalent of less than seven dollars a month. Um, so if you want uh, security, which you get through from the encryption and being able to apparently be from wherever you want around the world, um, then maybe ExpressVPN is for you. So uh, link in the description, as I said. Uh, right. Now, uh, all, and there's a 30 day money uh, back guarantee. So yeah, there's no risk. 24 hour, um, uh, seven days a week um, online. What's it called? Uh, customer services. That's it. 24 seven customer services. Sorry, I tripped over that. Anyway, ExpressVPN. Okay, uh, I won't play the uke again, don't worry. So, back to uh, the main topic of the video. Now, there's a chap called Dave Grossman. Uh, some of you may be familiar with him because he wrote the very good book, On Killing, the very influential book that you might want to have a look at, On Killing. And um, he wanted to study soldiers, uh, well, men in, men in action, what actually happens to their perceptions? How do, they, how do they see the world when they are actually in the action itself? But soldiers are quite difficult to study for a host of pretty obvious reasons. But the police, particularly in places like America, where they get involved in a lot of shootouts, unlike Britain, the police are much more studyable because after a police shootout, there will have to be loads of reports uh, filled in. All the various policemen will have to make statements. Investigators will come in and see where the cartridges fell and take photographs and witnesses will say exactly who was standing where and what happened. And they'll hand in their weapons for ballistics tests so that they'll be able to tell later which, which bullet was fired out of which gun at what point and in which direction. So. Uh, there's a huge amount more data that comes out of, of court reports and trials and all the rest of it. Plus, um, it's easier to, for various reasons, fairly obvious reasons, it's easier to interview police on what happened and what they perceived. So, they're a more studyable group than soldiers. And 85% of them reported that when in the thick of a gunfight, their world went silent. They completely blanked out all sound. So when one of them was uh, advancing and there was someone who could see that there was the thing, the thing, the thing that's behind him to his left. Watch he, he's, Why is he advancing? He, he can't have seen the thing. The thing, look out behind you on your left. There's an 85% chance, not that he won't hear you, there's an 85% chance that he can't hear you because he has just blanked out sound completely. There's a 15% chance that he might hear you, but yeah. Um, and 80% of them reported tunnel vision. They were just focused on what was in front of them. 65% of them said that the whole world went into slow motion. And uh, about 70% uh, of them reported that uh, visually they, they, everything was seen with much greater clarity, perhaps in, in, in conjunction with tunnel vision, or perhaps they became more situationally aware. Everything around them seemed suddenly so much clearer. Now, these are not universal, and some people even reported the opposite, that everything seemed to happen really, really quickly, and the, the, the sounds were super loud. Uh, but most people, it's, it's sensory uh, cutting down. Things are being blanked out. Sound goes, vision goes, and you focus on what's important, what requires attention right now, because that's going to make the difference, perhaps, between your life and your death. So, uh, can, can everyone um, focus? Can you focus on what's important? And what's not important? For, for instance, if you see these two discs, you see these two discs, there's a blue one and an orange one. Now, if uh, a blue one goes in front of an orange one, like this, you see, passing in front of it, then clearly that's important. 
and you should take note of that because that's a threat. Uh, whereas if an orange one goes in front of a blue one, well, that, that's neither here nor there. That's of no consequence whatsoever. But can you, do you think, pay attention when you need to and count the number of times in, say, a 30 second period, as timed on this cooker timer that I've just found here, uh, or rather prepared it, um, and, and what, there you go. So I'm going to press this and uh, count the number of times the blue passes in front of the orange. Go. Oh, yes. Now you see it already. I you can see that I've sort of cheated, haven't I? Because uh, there aren't uh, two discs. There are actually six. Uh, because I wanted to put you under more pressure. I wanted to give you a number of uh, uh, discs that you couldn't actually count. And uh, I'm also not going to shut up. I'm going to carry on talking. And uh, at the same time, I'm also going to be playing this exciting music. Um, so you've got all those things to contend with. So there's a pressure on. Can you count the number of times blue goes, oh, time's up. So how did you do? Well, I'm going to ask you the obvious question. What color was the snake's tongue? Well, what color was it? It was quite a, quite a bright and distinct color. And don't tell me that the snake wasn't big. I mean, it was a big snake and snakes are a threat. You've got to be wary of threats. You, when, you know, things are, 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 when you're under pressure and in a situation like that, you've got to be able to identify threats straight away. And a big snake, I mean, it was seriously big. I mean, it, it, its head was, was literally bigger than my hand. And if you didn't see it, well, well, if I've done that properly, then about half of you didn't see the snake. And if you really don't believe me that there was a snake, why don't you just rewind this a bit and uh, not you literally rewind on YouTube. Why don't you just go back in the timeline a bit and uh, play it back again and you'll see, oh yeah, there was a snake. And uh, for those roughly half of you who did see the snake, I want you to pat yourselves on the shoulder and, and, and congratulate yourselves. Oh, you clever you. Okay, uh, but the rest of you, good lord. Yes, it's amazing. Something as obvious as a large snake appearing right in front of you, right where you were actually looking and you didn't see it. How is that possible? Well, it's possible because people get completely transfixed, uh, like that guy who was being mugged and the knife and everything. They get completely transfixed on what they're paying attention to because they believe that's important and they miss other stuff. Sometimes things that to a, a, someone who's not under intense pressure, it seems completely bonkers that they miss that. How could you possibly? No, you couldn't have missed that. Now, it's thought uh, that what well, some psychologists will tell you that a human can hold can consciously control about seven things at once. So say so, yeah, you're playing the piano at a concert and so you're reading sheet music and then playing the left hand. So you're reading sheet music, that's one thing, and you're playing the left hand, you're ordering the hand to do the thing, so that's, that's two things. Uh, but with your right hand, uh, you're improvising. So you have to make up the notes you're going to improvise and then you have to actually get the hand to play them. So now is that four things? Let's call that four. And you're a performer, so you've got to engage with the audience. Eyes and teeth, everyone. Eyes and teeth. And you're actually looking at members of the audience and thinking about the audience and seeing how, how things are going and thinking about the next uh, song you perhaps you're going, to, you're going to play. Eyes and teeth. And uh, the, also uh, you're singing the song and not just singing the song. You're trying to put feeling into the lyrics. And maybe you're going to do something a little bit different because you don't want to sing it the same as you've always done in the past. It's a live performance. They've paid to see you. You want to be a little bit different. So you've got a lot going on about seven things, perhaps. Uh, and if you have several other things to do, oh, you'll lose it. You can't keep it all going. Now, um, there are some things that we fortunately can just switch to autopilot. Breathing, for example, excellent example. So whereas I can, like that, deliberately breathe consciously, most of the time I just switch to autopilot and let my uh, instincts handle it. Um, but when uh, you're under intense pressure, pressure of, for instance, being in a battle. You're actually being shot at. People left and right of you are actually dying. There are screams, there are explosions, there's all that sort of stuff. Then sphincter control and s balancing upright both get switched to manual. So you've got less brain uh, available for doing other stuff. And this is why uh, a lot of people will miss obvious stuff uh, when the when uh, under the, the pressure of battle. So for example, um, there are exercises where soldiers um, shoot paintballs at each other, but these aren't just the, like the, the air gun paintballs that you've, you've mucked around with with your friends in the park. No, no, these are military air, uh, air paintballs being fired from actual real guns with modern actual um, uh, explosive propellants. And these go much faster and they really seriously hurt. They can potentially even kill you. That's really rare, but they really seriously hurt. So soldiers don't want to be hit by these things. 
But in other exercises, they're just using uh, laser tag guns, so no pain involved. And uh, under both sets of circumstances, they're being observed by, by other men who are calmly standing there and just watching what's going on. They're not being shot at, they're not under high pressure, so they can use as much of their brain as they like uh, in the task of observing what is actually going on. And in the um, after-match um, uh, reports, it's noticeable that the people who were exercising with the paintballs had a much, much less coherent idea as to what the hell was going on. Their ability to assess what was going on, what other people were doing around them, uh, where the fire was actually coming from, uh, what their orders actually were, everything was much lower because they had less brain um, uh, to, to, to use, to play with, if you like. Whereas the guys who were uh, laser tagging, yeah, they had a much, a much stronger appreciation of what was going on, but still far from perfect. They still were trying not to be shot. They were still under pressure. And even back in the HQ, in, in, in the bunker, where people were not being shot at at all, but they were running things, so they're still under pressure because they've got to take in information and give out orders. And uh, if their team loses, well, they'll have to, I don't know, buy beers to everyone that night. So they're still under pressure and even on exercises, they will miss about a quarter of the information they're given. It just, it just passes them by. They don't get it. About a quarter of the information. And, importantly, if they're given two pieces of information at the same time, about one time in five, 20% of the time, they will conflate the two pieces of information. Those two become one. So, if they're told that... Um, uh, Alpha Company has uh, sighted uh, enemy tanks on the move and Bravo Company is being attacked by tanks. These two things get conflated. Oh, Alpha Company is being attacked by tanks. No, no. Alpha Company had sighted tanks. Perhaps they were the tanks attacking Bravo Company. But, oh, Alpha Company is being attacked by tanks. They've conflated the two bits of information. They send reinforcements to Alpha Company and no, that's wrong because of that mistake. And it's mistakes like that that lead to all sorts of foul-ups, to so-called blue-on-blue, friendly fire action. And um, one of the reasons is that um, people are often sleep deprived or they're really pumped up on adrenaline. And when people are at one of those extremes of arousal, uh, they're not very good at taking in new information. Um, now, I, I want you to imagine that you are, um, you're a medic and you're walking forwards and nothing much seems to be happening, but then a shot rings out. There's a sharp crap, a crack, and uh, someone ahead of you falls down, and someone shouts, Sniper! And then someone says, He's up in that tower over there! And a, a platoon is, is sent to flush out that sniper, and it seems they're doing the job, but oh, you're a medic, so you run forward to, to help that guy, and um, you roll him over, and you, you're ashen-faced, because you realise it's your friend, Dennis. Dennis, what the hell are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. Okay, but it's all right. You're a trained medic. Maybe you can help your friend, Dennis. Okay, so you roll him over, and you look at him, and you say, it doesn't look too bad. It looks very bad, but it's okay. Uh, you've got the equipment, and you, you, you should be able to save him. Okay, so um, start giving me the, the, the alphabet. Dennis, could you put your hand on there and press hard? Could you do that for me? C could you thank you, press hard? Stretcher! Okay, keep, keep going. To, uh, say the, the alphabet. Could you say the alphabet for me? Okay, I'm going to give you something for the pain. Give me something for the pain. Okay, right. Um, and I don't actually know what I'm doing here, but you know, imagine you're doing medical stuff. And so you get out the various tubes and, and, and dressings and, 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 and the snippy things and, and, and plasma. And you, you start, uh, hold, same with the, come on, P, Q, R. Yeah, come on, what comes after R in the alphabet? Come on, more There are explosions all around, but you can, you can save him. Okay, so uh, you put one, and then, whoa, and you're dead. Why are you dead? They dealt with the sniper, didn't they? Didn't they? Um, oh, you're dead because I said, do you remember? I said there are explosions all around. And then I carried on. And possibly you didn't notice because you were so taken up in this story about whether you could save Dennis or not that, uh, yeah, there are explosions all around. Yeah, but you never mind, you could save Dennis. Maybe I can give it, oh, and you're dead. So when you watch the war film and you can see uh, artillery shells are bursting all around the various characters and someone shouts, incoming! And you think, oh, talk about stating the obvious. Well, actually, soldiers are taught to state the obvious because people in situations like that miss the obvious. You don't say, go. You say, go, 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 like that. And you grab a guy and you shove him forward because maybe other guys will see him and then go, oh, yeah, go. And then, then you'll, you'll precipitate a, a go. And you, you repeat yourself and you state the obvious. And this is necessary because people uh, who are under extreme pressure miss stuff. So, um, imagine you are uh, walking to work in the morning 
and you hear uh, some some screaming from from your right and there's someone in, in, in a front garden possibly and you, you you look through the little clipped hedgerow and you can see a pair of feet and there's more screaming and okay so you open the gate you've never been on this property before you don't know who lives here but there's a guy there and he's suffered a freak uh, plant pot watering accident and he, he could die but fortunately you're there and so you do what's necessary and you save his life maybe you get a medal well done you okay so now imagine you're a soldier and you've had no sleep for two days and you've just been shelled for six hours and you're still shaken and half deafened by that and now you've gone forward and uh, there is uh, uh, there's fire incoming fire coming at you but you can't tell where the hell this fire is coming from and you've got your commander talking to you in your ear and he's saying all sorts of stuff that makes no sense to you he keeps saying move along the street to the cinema the cinema I can't see a cinema I could, there's, a, there's a barn up there is that what he thinks this is? and that the shots are still coming in and you really don't know whether you're in a safe position or not but you can see an alleyway over there so you go over to that alleyway completely ignoring the guy in the front garden who was just five yards to your right who was screaming his head off and six months later, there you are in the dock in court, and uh, it's been proven quite clearly by witness statements and, and objective uh, evidence. Maybe there are aerial photographs or whatever. That you were within five yards of that civilian. And in fact, you were totally unharmed. And uh, it was later established, perhaps, that the, the rounds being fired were, were landing nowhere near you. Um, so you couldn't possibly have not noticed. That was, that was criminal negligence. You let that person die, and you are criminally culpable, possibly. Is that fair? Should we uh, hold a soldier in the dock to the same standards as a, as a civilian in an equivalent situation? Because when um, you're under extreme pressure in a military situation and your brain is just filled with other things, you miss obvious stuff. So I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not going to say one way or the other. I'm just going to say that that, that is a uh, it's, it's, a, it's an issue. It's an issue whether uh, soldiers should be held accountable in the same way that civilians are. Um, now. Um, sometimes uh, men just sort of shut down, like 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 C-3PO. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm just going to shut down for a moment. And one time that this happens uh, on occasion is after a successful attack. So the enemy was in that position, and some of the men get in their grenades, bayonets, fully automatic weapons, and they, they they kill some of the enemy, rout the rest, and they're alive. They did that incredibly dangerous thing, and they're alive. And they sit down, and they're alive, and the adrenaline goes and they just they, they power down which is why immediately after attack it's uh, vital to get fresh troops into that area to hold it in case there's an immediate as sometimes happens uh, enemy counter-attack because the guys who have just uh, won a victory are, are very often I can't say usually but are very often in uh, no mental state uh, to defend the, the, the territory that they've just taken um, now um, one of the problems with studying uh, military failures, trying to work out what went wrong, is that uh, people will close ranks. They don't want to snitch on their on their friends. Um, they know that mistakes were made, but they don't want uh, to tell someone, some investigator, who perhaps won't re ever really completely understand because he wasn't there, what they think actually happened. Um, and uh, but. On exercises, you can observe the sort of thing that presumably does happen in war. For example, a wonderful anecdote I read, I think it was British, this guy. It was a British officer on an exercise who three times, yes, that's right, three times shot down, not really shot down, because in the exercise, he synthesized shooting down his own reconnaissance helicopter, despite being on a telephone, being uh, talked to by someone telling him what he was doing. So yes, right. So we were dealt with that helicopter. Yeah, what's that? Uh, no, um, tell Le Lieutenant uh, Stansbrook to, to do that and get 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 James on it. Get John to it. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. So just keep shooting at the helicopter and give me reports. That, what's that? What? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Terrific. Uh, yes. So what? What? No, 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 no. Not not our reconnaissance helicopter. The enemy one that I keep telling you to shoot down. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. The other, just stop telling me about that. The other helicopter can report in good time. We, the, our priority is to shoot down this one that you just. To, yeah. What? What is it now? And uh, what? We shot it down. Okay. Great. What do you mean it was our helicopter? But, oh, not again. So when you're under pressure, you can make really quite embarrassing mistakes. Um, and about half the time, it seems, when an attack goes wrong, it goes wrong because um, 
Troops uh, do not react to a changing situation. There was a plan that they knew about, that they'd agreed on, that they'd perhaps rehearsed, and that they quite liked and were happy with because it was, you know, they were familiar with it, and familiar familiarity is a good thing. And uh, during the battle, new information came to light, and new orders were written to respond to this change of situation. These new orders came in, and they might not be noticed, they might be ignored for lots of the reasons that I've already described, but also people will try to, to try to make them the same. These orders are, yeah, they'll, yeah, these orders are actually the same as the orders that we'll, we'll carry on doing what we're doing. So they'll come up with that excuse, but they'll also come up with the excuse if they do realize that these orders are actually different. Well, yeah, but I think that what we're actually doing is better. They will come up with a, a rationalization in their own heads for why their current action is actually the best thing to be doing. And they won't change, uh, they won't change tack. They won't to react to a change of situation. And so the attack therefore goes wrong. Uh, for that reason, about half the time when an attack goes wrong, it seems that that's uh, one of the root causes. Now, uh, you might think that uh, having one person in charge is a bit risky because he might he might uh, make these uh, simple mistakes that other people would pick up on, or he might take risks that other people wouldn't take, whereas a committee is not going to take a risky decision. But actually, it seems that um, command in battle by committees uh, is actually worse in that they take greater risks and that they go with not the best plan, but the plan that's going to cause the fewest arguments. It's the least objectionable plan, not the one that's actually best at getting the job done. And um, they're able to take greater risks because no one wants to be the guy who says, well, that's a bit risky. Oh, come on, where's your gumption, man? And besides, no one's responsible. If it goes wrong, no one person made that decision. If one person makes a decision, he's probably going to be a bit, <clears throat> a bit careful about taking risks, but a committee is actually more likely to do risky things. Um, and, um, okay, just a couple more points just to finish off. One is that uh, in actions, this is involving the, the US Army and the British Army uh, in modern times, if a company is given three tasks to do, and other companies are given five or more tasks to do, the company with three tasks to do is twice as likely to succeed as the ones given five or more. In other words, keep it simple. One of the reasons that uh, commanders are never given more than four units to command is that it's just too much to do you will end up ignoring people or uh, causing horrendous confusion. Four is about the maximum number of units that any commander at any level can deal with. Um, so keep it simple. And if you are a commander and you give orders to, uh, uh, to your men, any given man is only about 50% likely to do the thing. The rest of the time he'll be frozen or fussing or just oblivious. Did the